What is it about abandoned places that fascinate us so much? Is it out of sheer curiosity? Who lived here? Why did they leave? Or is it because they're eerily beautiful? This place has been without human occupation for a long time now. And although nature is slowly taking over, it still looks as if this community left only yesterday. Everyone who'd lived here left overnight after a series of devastating events. With plans for Riley, myself and the kids to sail Asia for the next two years at least after we've finished building our new trimaran, we jumped at the opportunity to sail in Svalbard, the northernmost territory we've ever visited, and I guess ever will. Our voyage aboard the beautiful twin-masted schooner called the Nordelicht has been a lot different to the sailing we've done over the past eight years. We've been learning something new every day, and our time aboard this ship was nearing an end. The last stop on our journey, though, was no doubt going to be the most unique experience of this trip. Visiting an abandoned Russian communist ghost town on the edge of civilization. Can't see anyone up. Lenny woke me up, it's 5am. Might do some gym stuff. Sailing beam reach with schooner sail, first day sail, and inner tip. And we've got 15, 16, 17 knots. Yeah, around that. From aft of a beam. Yes, and doing a steady six and a half uh, knots. So yep. that's fine. If you had the full mainsail up, how fast would you be going right now? Yeah, and with the outer chip, we can do eight knots, nine knots, no problem. You. Do you reckon today is the coldest day? Yep. It's pretty damn cold. We'd made it to 81 degrees north and it was getting colder and colder as the days wore on. Soon enough, the sun in the sky that currently never set would disappear for months. Personally, we were happy to avoid this, although we admire the locals for sticking out the dark season. Anyway, before we'd be creeped out by Pyramiden, the Russian ghost town, we were to ground ourselves, literally and figuratively, with a peaceful hike. Such a gentleman. Today's hike to see the Nonser Brain. <laughs> Don't know if I'm saying that right. Nonser Glacier. Brain. Has me feeling a bit like I'm on the moon. This is very moon, moony vibes I'm picking up. Every probably, what, minute or two? Nonser. We're hearing a big glacier crash. Nansenbrunn is a glacier. It has a length of about 14 kilometres and had us looking like tiny dots on a giant white canvas. The glacier is named after explorer, scientist, diplomat and humanitarian Frithjof Nansen, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. I didn't know there'd be so much hiking on this trip. It's nice that we're walking so much. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. you got to get off the boat. Stretch the legs. We go on massive hikes every out. day and then we go back to the boat starving <laughs> and have the nicest food. Hungry. Like, hungry. <laughs> For anyone who might just be tuning in, I'm going to link our previous four episodes from this Arctic voyage in the description below. You've got a lot to catch up on. And please hit that subscribe button, which is free to do, so you can come sailing with us regularly. Your depth perception is so off, like it's really hard to look around and judge how far, how long it'll take you to walk there or just yeah, how far it is. Binocular depth cues are the images taken in by both eyes to give depth perception. In our case, this part of the Norwegian archipelago had no trees or houses by which we could judge distance. And so as we stared out at the glacier, we were at a loss for depth perspective. Neil Shubin, paleontologist, evolutionary biologist and author of Your Inner Fish writes, without a solid sense of distance, it's difficult to determine the size of the object or critter. Indeed, whilst Rally and I found the lack of our binocular depth cues a fascinating visual phenomenon to experience, it should be said that this lack of depth perception can be highly dangerous in these areas because we were hiking in one of the most polar bear dense areas of Svalbard. Accurate depth perception can be the difference between life or death. Up here. Engines are off. We are sailing. What'd you do, Ray? Oh, I can't tell you the names of the sails, but I think 
put up, I helped put up this big one, and I'm just doing whatever they're telling me to do. <laughs> Pulling whatever rope you need to. I have absolutely no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> None at all. How fast are we going? Six and a half knots. And later on we have to veer away mm -hmm. a bit, and we will enter the Billefjorden. And then we're gonna go to Pyramiden uh, today, that's the plan. The abandoned Russian uh, town. There was one crew member we had on board, Larry, 80 years old, who was the most excited to visit Pyramid. Bring back a few memories, mate. It does, it does indeed. It, the, the, the place has been modernised. The thing that everyone's been talking about is your history here. What did you leave here and in what year? Well, some people leave their hearts in San Francisco. <laughs> I left my appendix in Pyramid. <laughs> in what year was that? In 1961. I've come to pick it up. <laughs> so some and ways tour. we've entertained the kids. Mama, let me take two and two and two. Yeah, we and can make and a tour. cocktail. And two 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 we come into my room and see what we can find, make a mess. Uh, we played with some cards. The boys have a stuffed animal each, as well as some cars and trucks. A little colouring in book with a magic pencil, it's just water. They get outside every day. Um, Lenny's been to the beach once. The beach is pretty cold and I know they'll be complaining after an hour and we're usually at the beach for like a couple of hours, so. Yeah. yeah. Uh. Thank you. Uh, Say hello. <laughs> Good boy. Yes, what is it? It's a it's a coloring book. It's a, a drawing? Yeah. What's it a drawing of? Well you have to see it with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> is it a ship? No, it's a ship. <laughs> Behind me is Pyramiden. So this is the crown jewel of Svalbard. It's the last place that we're stopping. It's the place where Larry left his appendix and Marco's actually never been here. So we're gonna be anchoring here overnight, which the crew are very, very happy about because they've been they've done a three hours on, three hours off rotation all last night because we were sailing all through the night. So they're gonna get a much needed rest here. And we're gonna go and explore Pyramiden tomorrow. Lenny, where are we? We are, we are here. It's all the way up to the hook. Darwin's teeth uh, have all decided to come through on this trip. He had, a, he had a bunch, but now I think the painful ones are coming through, like these fangs. And he is constantly just eating all the grapes. I feel really bad, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know you mean, Bill. What's the deal, Riley? I drew the short straw. Nah, I'm, I said to... I'm looking after the kids. Also, everyone goes to the bar. It's actually pretty special. They have opened the pub just for us tonight. There's two pubs. Believe it or not, because everything to me looks abandoned. It would be a crime not to go and have a vodka and something. That's what we're doing. Pub crawl tonight. So before the internet, they had to come here wow. to like call from over here. just got home and I was saying to Riley how bizarre the town is. It's, it was so eerie walking there. They really put emphasis on the warning for polar bears. So like if there's any place a polar bear's gonna pop out, it's here. So not only were we like expecting a polar bear to just pop out at any moment, but um, the bar from the outside, it's so run down. And then inside we walked in i wasn't expecting to see anyone else in there but then there was like five to ten what looked like russians sitting down in the couch area watching an old russian movie and we all got a drink at the bar and kind of like took up half the space <laughs> yeah it was just bizarre the bartenders kept apologizing they were like sorry there's nothing we have no ingredients when here. you ordered a drink did they say acknowledged no, but they kept apologising for the fact they had no, yeah, no limes or lemons. They were like, because we're here in the Arctic. <laughs> we're like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> we don't need, need a lime. Anyway, that was a cool experience. Mm, I'm glad I did that.
How's your teeth, baby D? Better? You got great. Boots on, Lenny boy. So Rachel did a tour of the town last night after the bar. She didn't get home till what, 1.30 or something? So she got the twilight tour. I'm glad she did that last night because now Riley and I have an opportunity to go see the town with Lenny. We can leave Darwin behind because he just cries. <laughs> Going to go learn about the history. At any given time, there may be polar bear in or around the settlement. That is also the reason that the group always stays together. The reason the settlement got its name very nice to see today. The mountain is formed like an Egyptian or Mayan pyramid. That's where the settlement got its name. If you've been looking at this landscape and wondering why the heck anyone would want to claim land up here in the first place, it was not only the opportunity for coal mining, but another reason we learned was because as the polar ice caps melt in the north, a new ocean will be created and a new trading route will open up, which now Russia will have some control of. Isn't that so sad and a wild thing to think about? Like, I, I can't even believe that. There's no kids. There's no kids. Yeah, the kids are gone, Lenny. This is, this is a very, very old school. It's not, it's not working anymore. No, there's no one here. So let's take it back. During Soviet times, Russia built two mining towns, Pyramiden being one of them. The construction and ability to live in this town was only possible with the support of the mainland Soviet Union. In 1920, the Svalbard Treaty was created and any country that signs this treaty has rights to come and build, mine and extract however much they'd like, even though this land is supervised by Norwegian law. 46 countries have signed this treaty around the world. This is where the KGB is to hang out. Seriously, the, the, these are the bars and they can close them up so that no one can see what they were up to. There's a stove here where they used to burn secret documents. Oh my God. Yeah. No way. Pyramiden was founded in 1927. The community was thriving with over 1,200 inhabitants at its peak. Then, in two short years and some disasters, it was all over by 1998. The Russians could no longer afford to keep Pyramiden running. Pyramiden had suffered a fire, the inferno had engulfed a mine site, which caused a lot of casualties, and then in 96, a plane traveling from Moscow to Svalbard crashed into Opera Mountain, killing 141 coal miners. There was also the trifling matter of the fall of the Soviet Union, which probably had something to do with it also. Nobody's sure. The settlement was abandoned not long after, the people in a hurry to get out of there, leaving behind its nightmares and its dreams. Hey Lenny, what did we just do? No, we went to, we went to that house. We should go in that place. Good boy. So the dude doing the tour was just hilarious. He, he, he didn't said, know it though. So he said back in the day they would, because there was no money on the premises, uh, you were under contract, so everything was free within the they were, they were bartering with alcohol. So there was, there's a, um, a very strong Muslim community there, some of whom wouldn't consume alcohol. Some of them did, um, claiming that Allah couldn't see them in the dark season. <laughs> And he went, he went on to say, what was he? He said, um, they would barter, you know, uh, sometimes they would trade biscuits, some, sometimes they would trade um, maybe a pair of sausages. <laughs> <laughs> so he meant to say a packet of sausages. <laughs> but I cry but laugh. And Elena and I just lost A pair of shit. sausages. But I was going to say, you can imagine how good life might have been. Um, during the peak of this in the 70s and 80s yeah yeah like had a gym swimming um, pool sauna um, organized 25 person orgies really high quality this guy food. was talking about sex for most of that <laughs> the ship is not coming there were concerts it and just looked like it would have been a lot of fun at the time and we're just happy to leave politics aside for the minute and just visit an old russian Settlement. So picturesque, we definitely could have spent more time there. And not as eerie as I would have thought. <laughs> when he was tiny, his mother fed him milk and allowed him to walk on the lawn. The captain and crew had moved us in the night, our last night on board, so we could wake up in an anchorage in a beautiful fjord. 
We'd heard on the radio that a polar bear and her two cubs had been spotted here, so it was decided that we'd waste no time and drop the anchor, ready to scout the area when we'd all wake up. I really, really hoped that we'd all get to see a polar bear before we left. We seemed to have crossed off a lot of other species on the list already, except this one. Unfortunately, we had no luck. Again, the only signs of bears we saw were their footprints in the mud. On the bright side, I feel like it was the universe's way of getting us to come back to Svalbard a second time, because now I have to. And Riley was super nice to me for the rest of the day and was trying to make me laugh. He even said he'd wash my boots with his bare hands. Get it? Bare hands. I didn't think it was particularly funny either when he first said it, but I laughed anyway because it was sweet. <laughs> What happened? I'm sure I've seen this in a movie where he slides down, he's got his foot like that, and he like slides down using the friction of his boot. Maybe it was Peter Pan? Oh, yeah. After our antics on the bowsprit, it was fair to say us vagabonds were going a little stir-crazy on board. It was time to head back to Longyearbyen and disembark the Nautilict for good. What a place we got to call home for a time. It's snowing. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, Freezing. The thing that I wanted to say about the Nordelikt, it's the opposite of a cruise ship. So you get on board, there's the opportunity to help if you want, you can sail. Um, they, they let you throw ropes, they let you tie docking lines, and you feel like you're part of the adventure. I could be having caviar and a whole bunch of, of stuff, and moment to moment that might feel amazing, but when I look back on a trip, I'm like, oh, I kind of did nothing. Yeah. But that one there, you look back on and you're just like, oh my God, we just killed it. We did yeah. a whole bunch of stuff, so much had hiking. so much fun. And the crew, I just, oh, I mean, I could crew. learn from. So that We was... made some really, really good friends. We're so grateful for the ex not only the experience, I'm pretty upset we didn't see a polar bear, but I'll get over that. And I guess I'm we're going to come back. I was just happy. <laughs> really couldn't recommend Swan Expeditions highly enough. We'll put the link in the description below if you want to check it out or book a trip. It's not super hard to get here unless you have two small children. Can we go inside now? I'm bloody cold. No, I'm fine. <laughs> Look, it's all landing in your red hair. Turn around. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. Oh my gosh, to anyone who's seen snow, they're probably like, oh my gosh, you guys are such losers, but this is exciting. Oh, you're joking. <laughs> you're joking. If a shirtless Riley wandering aimlessly through freezing cold puddles doesn't scream, I need new adventure, I don't know what does. Join us next week as we hike to one of Norway's most remote lighthouses which we'll be calling home. We've always wanted to stay in a lighthouse, so this one's pretty special.